This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. And welcome back, ladies and gents. So, this is your third and final listener choice episode of December. And uh, we're doing something a little bit different. We've not done anything like this before. And to be honest, it has only been the chance, opportunity, that I've had this month to gain a bit of time and get a chance to catch up with a a long-time friend of mine who has been uh, very busy in the last year changing careers and uh, undertaking moulding and shaping of um, our, you know, our future. He is shaping the future. Uh, one student at a time. We have a show called Duncan and Bo Come Correct, which is on a little bit of a hiatus and will return at some point in the future. But rather than go the entire year without catching up properly with the shenanigans that only me and this man can do, allow me to bring him into the fold before I tell you what we're doing. It is, of course, my good buddy, long-time collaborator, Mr. Bo Ransdell. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing excellent. I'm so excited to be doing this. I like we we did the director's roundtable recently, which is always tremendous fun. Yeah, oh like oh uh, oh what was it? Five and a bit hours of it. So yeah. We we, we yeah. got through it. It was good. I I think we can double it <laughs> on this episode. But that's always really fun because yeah. I love I love Doug to death. Yeah. He is so smart. Way way smarter than I am. And, and, and so, me. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. He's, he really does carry that. I always kind of feel like I have underprepared when I show, show up. <laughs> what does Doug yeah. think about this subject? All right. That's so much smarter than how I would have ordered it. Let's just go with Doug. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Every time I go after Doug in that rotation, yeah. I'm pretty much like, what he said. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Like Doug goes to explain something, and uh-huh. halfway through the ten points he's made, my one point comes up, and he mentions it. And I'm like, I'm fucked now. Like he's like, I've got like literally nothing to say, and he's somehow got another nine points. That I'm like, oh, I wish I thought of that. Never thought of it like that. That's actually really a smart point, Doug Tilly. Yeah, I, like I just, I you know, I put my <laughs> head in my hands. Like, tell me a story, Mister Tilly. <laughs> tell me about movies. <laughs> Uh, and I, like I'm not being sarcastic about that. Like yeah. genuinely, he is he is incredibly talented when it comes to oh yeah very succinctly and sharply analyzing movies. Mm-hmm. And so I love doing the show for that. But then the point I was gonna make is <laughs> I like that this is just us because we're stupid <laughs> and. <laughs> And so we can be mutually dumb without the the shadow of Doug hanging over us to try to pretend to be smart for a minute. <laughs> we should have a podcast called In the Shadow of Doug. But yeah. We'll just that'll be the next TVC season. We'll just be in the shadow of Doug. We'll just do movies that he's done. Yeah. But our podcast will just be a review of the podcast he did about the movie. Like, not better, but like at all, even oh. slightly. <laughs> no, no, no. A pale shadow of of, of that man's fine work. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. so, so yeah. movies, Duncan. Yeah. You love them. I love them. <laughs> so yeah, I am. Um, I, like I say, I, I wanted to. I wanted to like get like a chance for us to do something this year, and um, 
I, there was, I, I thought originally my, my brain was going towards the direction of, oh, we'll pick a movie to discuss, or we'll talk about the year that was 2023 and the highs and, uh, and sometimes very dizzying lows, of which there have been a few. Um, and then I kind of thought, you know what, it'd be much more interesting just freeform a topic and I'll let the listeners pick it. And to be honest with you, there were some really, really good discussion points here. Some of them we've covered before in other shows, whether it's things like, uh, like conversations on the the pros and cons of horror remakes um Mm -hmm. which i mean we've done we could have done it again it would have been no problem i think the one that kind of caught my attention it would have forced me to finally sit down and watch um the 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 fall of the house of usher um was Mm. that as a concept which i've still not watched now i would have if it had been the topic obviously so i haven't watched that yet and that was one that was almost it almost won and then at the last minute, a sea of votes, a flurry of votes came in for the actual talking point, which is, um, in, in the world that we live in just now, in the past decade, E24 and art house horror has kind of dominated the attention uh, of both reviewers and audiences alike. Um, but do we see this as something that is now dwindling out? And if so, Bo Ransdell, what do we think takes its place? So I suppose... In terms of breaking this down, I, I, do we both agree with the, the opening gambit that E24 and that kind of oeuvre of art house horror is actually on the decline? Oh, I wish Doug was here. <laughs> um... <laughs> Can we get him? Do you think he'll be busy? <laughs> yeah, well, let's, let's, uh, I'm going to message him and see what he thinks. <laughs> um, do I think it's on the decline? Not really. I, I think that it's it, it's sort of been one of those things where it it seemed really fresh and unique for a while because yeah. there was a glut of what felt like a lot of sameness yeah. around yeah. horror films and so when you had honest to goodness really great directors mm-hmm. like for a long time horror movies uh, the, the I'm over generalizing so forgive me but for a while, there was a period where horror movies were largely ignored by studios. Yep. It was sort of like, we're, we're not going to spend a lot of money on these movies. Even the early Blumhouse stuff. Of, mm-hmm. We're going to we're gonna cap the, the budget so we don't spend too much. And it's going to be good or it's not going to be good or whatever, but it's probably going to be profitable. And that's... You know, one of one of the truisms of Hollywood is you can always count on horror movies to make a certain amount of money. No matter how good or bad they are, you can always get, you know, 20, 30, 40 million dollars out of uh, a horror movie. And then, you know, A24 comes along and you've got legitimately great directors with interesting ideas and, uh, and visions behind it. You know, whether it's Babadook or It Follows or Hereditary, you know, all that long list of movies that everybody thinks of when they think about kind of the modern classics and you know your terror fires mm-hmm. um and Dude, then sassy sassy lad <laughs> i know yeah, I, 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 we both agree on terrifying I, I, yeah. I, but <laughs> <laughs> so that became the story mm-hmm. that like oh holy shit like there is this renaissance in horror movies sort of like there was in the 70s with like Jaws and Exorcist and Omen and you know these movies that are like oh like really good directors with really good ideas are making really good horror movies all of a sudden and that became the story for a while and I don't think that it's changed Mm -hmm. I think you still have that I mean like Robert Eggers is about to release Nosferatu for fuck's sake yeah yeah so you know, I, I think there is still that place. And, you know, just a shout out to a movie I saw this year that I really like, like Cobweb. Yeah. I think is a terrific horror film that came out of nowhere, but it's really well directed and it's really stylized and it plays with horror tropes in a way that most big budget doesn't do. And even something like No One uh, no one Will Save You yep. is like, oh, here's this kind of interesting idea that it, it's sort of low budget and it has kind of this high concept idea. And um, So that stuff is still happening. Uh, but in addition to that, there has also been a resurgence of big budget, high profile, less artsy horror yeah. movies. 
Yeah. You know, like like an Evil Dead Rise, mm -hmm. for example, which is like this is a totally fine Evil Dead movie. Yeah. <laughs> and and I mean that's damning it with faint praise, but it's it, it's like a totally fine horror experience. It is not super artsy. It is not like you don't have to go to a coffee house later and dissect it. Uh <laughs> you know, like you do with uh, you know, Bo is afraid or something. Yeah. Um, but both of those things now exist simultaneously. And I think maybe that makes it feel like things have changed when I don't really think that's the case. I, I think that the art house stuff is still there and still coming out and you still have a lot of really interesting directors doing really interesting things, but also there, because studios are like, wait a second, yeah. I think if we just make big budget horror movies, people are going to go see it. Like. It's like, yeah, yeah, we've known this for Ever. 60 fucking years. <laughs> yes. And and just every now and again, like some yeah. cigar chomping asshole is like, wait a second. <laughs> I think if we give somebody $10 million to make another screen movie, that might make money. Yeah, you know? like, like, if, only we had, if only we had the evidence of this. Oh, what's that? There's years and years of uh, box office data that we can just <laughs> look at there. Oh, that's uh, that's interesting. Like, very few but, horror studios go out, like, the studios that, like, dedicate themselves to horror go out of business. They tend to be bought over by bigger studios who want to own them because they are so fucking profitable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, like, not everybody is a James Wan who yeah. can get away with pulling a malignant for, like, you're <laughs> going to give me $40 million and I'm going to make this fucking bonkers half giallo half basket case movie yeah and <laughs> uh you know so not everybody can get away with that thing but well i mean what do you do uh, how do you feel about it? do you feel like there is a, a deficit of art house movies compared to the the heady days of what well, my it my, follows <clears throat> and so forth one of my favorite movies last year was um, Alex Garland's Men, which was an A24 mm. art house horror movie. So I mm -hmm. don't think the are. I think A24, using them as an example, them being the exemplar studio that kind of has set a template or like a, a, a kind of shining example of how these movies could be profitable or how they could be released, have themselves released a variety of different horror movies in the last couple of years their work with Ty West doing the you know X into Peril into what will be Maxine they did that Bodies 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 movie which I thoroughly enjoyed which is mm -hmm. a, a, a kind of social satire like slasher movie uh, this year they did Talk to Me which obviously has is kind of is more a, 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 of all their movies is probably the one that is most dim the middle horror um, mm -hmm. it, a, yeah, yeah, you know, super good, but yeah, yeah. So I mean, like they themselves as a studio, I think that the problem is that it could be seen as them moving away from it. When I don't think, I think when you look at what they do as a studio, is that they do the at the very similar Blumhouse, like you mentioned, they give people the opportunity to make movies that would struggle in any other system, and as a result, you get moreover with I think. A24, you get a very diverse range of directors from completely different parts of the world. Uh, Talk to me is essentially a you know as a Australian horror movie slash New Zealand mm -hmm. kind of like is that is that Antipodean sort of part of the world where they're that they're, that's the sort of horror there. When I think of uh, bodies, 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 it's coming from a different writing point than Alex Garland, who's writing Men. So you're getting all these different voices that lead into that, and that kind of flavours it. I don't think it's gone away. Very similar to yourself, I feel there is... there's more choice for people now than there was back in 2012, when A24 was kind of first starting to, to flex out. I think it's also... I think the indie horror movie scene from like 2010 and 2011 feed into that a little bit as well. So if you look at movies like Me, which is a great example of a like no studios, like no big studios releasing a movie like Me. However, it's mm -hmm. a high concept horror movie. You know what I mean, it's a horror movie that's dealing with isolation and loneliness and the, the effects of that on someone's grasp of 
on reality and how that affects them in you know like day-to-day -day relationships and like the, the the kind of fracturing of their psyche like in that like or excision which came out about the same time which is also something that works on a kind of art house high concept level so i think it was happening before a24 i think a24 were the ones that kind of solidified the the template of how to do it and gave it a bit more, I don't want to use the word prestige because that instantly gets people, oh, prestige honor, but gave it a mm -hmm. bit more pomp and circumstance about it. Um, and made, like you say, made these things feel like bona fide movies that you go and see in the cinema. I spoke about it at the time. I went to see in a multiplex cinema, The Lighthouse, on the big screen. And I was like, it was the end of the decade. And I was remembering yeah. what I'd seen in 2010 in the cinema and I was looking at 2019 looking at this movie in the cinema I was like how did we get here like we've like went the other way like, like we've went to a movie that deliberately folds you into a like uncomfortable aspect ratio on a large screen that is in ye old timey language which is forcing itself in black and white which is basically a love story hidden underneath all this symbolism and mythology and greek tragedy and like and, and it's on the big screen a movie that like seven years before would have played in two independent cinemas in scotland for one night is doing a three-week run on the big screen in the largest cinemas in the country how did we end up here so that's maybe the highest point maybe that's the expansion of it to its maximum maybe it's contracting i don't think it's over and i think if anything the fact that we're maybe not getting as many is not necessarily a bad thing because you do get to a point where i think a24 we're working through their uh, filmography as part of a series which we need to finish you me and jamie and um to put things into perspective, we were doing them in groups, and I had I'd split into three sections, and that third section had five movies in it. We've not recorded an episode in that in a year, and I am now going to be in the position that I could almost split that into three episodes of content mm -hmm. because of how many movies have released. So, less might not necessarily be a bad thing overall. It gives room. D All right. So, d two things. Yep. First. Have we explicitly talked about men? We, I don't know that we have. We haven't got to men yet. Uh, that wasn't okay. In the, that wasn't in our. That that is on probably not even the next day twenty four episode. It's probably going to be the one after that. But the, I I know it's one that when I saw it, I told you specifically yeah. like this is going to knock your fucking socks. Off. Oh yeah 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 yeah. Because it came out over there before it came out over here. Yeah, and. Men, I think, is one of the best examples of how you take a Cronenbergian body horror movie oh, gotcha. <laughs> and turn it into allegory in a way that very few filmmakers are able to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, the, the last, what, 20 minutes of Men is one of the best things I've seen in a theater in the past decade. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of just, like, I can't... I mean, to your point about seeing The Lighthouse, of, like this is in theaters <laughs> yeah what in the fuck happened <laughs> that this film and you know or like uh a, a totally different example but but similar in in concept like godzilla minus one comes out and becomes like the the biggest foreign film of the year playing a week yeah. in american theaters because people are like it's it, here's here's it, th this is the second point i was gonna make that that i think you and i are both kind of saying is that the 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 highway of horror has widened yes there are just more lanes yes you know so if you like scream and bodies 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 which weirdly seem to occupy like a mental space for me uh, -huh. uh of that kind of younger hipper self-referential meta horror kind of thing okay so that's one lane and then you have, you know, fucking men and yeah. uh, the lighthouse and and that kind of thing. That is like the bigger art house, headier kind of stuff. And then there's like weirdly, uh, I, I think the real news of the past five, six years is that like splatter movies have yeah. come back. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and as much as you and I both don't really care for Terrifier, um, that was really a herald of like, oh, there is an audience that's kind of clamoring for a return to those days of 80s, like 
video horror yeah, where it was unrated shit. Yeah. yeah. Like I was watching um, a movie called Visitors today, the Japanese film uh-huh. that is kind of Evil Dead-ish in the sense that it's just like people vomiting up green shit and yeah. turning into <laughs> monsters and people with like chainsaw hands and stuff like that. And the, the movie itself is not necessarily great, but it's like, oh, this is like, this is a weird return to a, a, a time. Like it, 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 like everything is out there now. Yeah. Everything is out there and there's an audience for all that stuff. And it's the good and bad of the death of the monoculture, you yeah. know, is that there's not, there's not one type of horror movie being released. It's not just art house stuff. It's not just, more popular mainstream kind of Hollywood popcorn horror. It's all of that stuff all at the same time. Yeah. And, and that's great for horror fans because on any given day, you can watch a, a splatter movie. And then the next day, watch something that's more like allegorical and more uh, literary. And then, you know, turn around, like you can see, uh, Oh, what was an uh, influencer? Yeah, was one that I really enjoyed this year. That's like, well, this is almost like it kind of stretches the definition of horror, but what else do you call it? Yeah, and but you know, and then the next night you watch, you know, Cobweb, and like that movie presents like art house horror, and then by the end of it, it's like, oh no, this is just a bonkers monster in the house kind of movie, which yeah. is fucking great, you know. Um, so it, you know, it, 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 it's the benefit. There's like a real cornucopia of opportunities for horror filmmakers because now nothing's off limits. You don't yeah. have to make one horror movie or another. You don't have to make an art house movie to be successful. You can like Robert Eggers has the, you know, that's where he has pitched his tent yep. and God bless him because he's amazing. But then you see something like, uh, have you seen the last voyage of the D- uh, Demeter? Um, it's not out here yet. I th- um, oh, okay. I um, think um, I'm kind of actually, I would surprise that hasn't come out here yet. So I am hoping to get a screener before the year is out though for the end of year. So I saw it got really good reviews. So I'm, uh, who was the director of that? I was someone I uh, knew of. So yeah. Uh, oh, Andre Overdahl, the guy who did. Uh, uh, Troll Hunter and Autopsy of Jane Doe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The scary stories to tell in the dark. So he's the guy behind it. And it, it like that is a movie that on paper I should hate. Yeah. You know, <laughs> of, like here's a movie where we are taking four pages out of Dracula yeah. and turning it into a movie. And then you watch it and you're like, oh, this is Alien on a boat. Yeah. And this fucking rules. Yeah. And so, it, like, there is something, like, anybody can do anything now. And that is both the good and the bad. Because yeah. you can do anything, and as a result, the, the market is flooded. I mean, my biggest complaint is it is hard to find good curation of, yeah. like, this is good, this is bad. Because yeah. there's 15 horror movies coming out every week, and the question is, which of those are worth your time? Yeah, I think the the voices of jet like everyone has their own source of of quality to an extent where you know particular people are like this person is usually my barometer of whether or not I'm going to enjoy something, um, and those voices are now many. There's so mm. much more people uh, commenting, so much more sites dedicating their attention to horror, and depending on that person's leanings in the past there was a, well, you kind of have to be funneled this way to review movies, and that's not the case anymore. It's Like you say, there are, there, there are so many lanes and so much content that finding, it, it does become a bit of a gamble of, do I end up, we were speaking about this off air, of, do I watch this new TV show, which I'm a couple episodes in and I'm thinking to myself, eh, it's not great and I don't know where it's going, or, actually, I've been really meaning to revisit Twin Peaks I could just go back through that <laughs> and I, th- I find that I, I find moreover this year than any other year is I think the first year where I've not completely dedicated my attention to the current year of horror so I'd like my end of year to-do list 
is huge uh, for movies that I will need to watch in a, a, in a space that I know for a fact had I been using the same methods I'd done in previous years, I would have ticked a lot of them off. Um, but I, I think you're right. I think, uh, I, but I also think the years feel shorter, but it's harder to place when movies come out now. Like, I keep having to remind myself that uh, Brandon Cronenberg's movie came out this year. Mm-hmm. Like, right, like to me, that feels like a, that was a last year movie. Uh, and it's one of my favourite things I've seen this year. And I'm, I'm kind of like... I, but was that the, or was that last year and that, that it just speaks to the, the sheer volume this is a year like for people that are like oh I mean we're really you know like the, things have become so insular and you know there's only one way to make it like arguably Eli Roth has rela- released the best horror movie he's done in over a decade like mm-hmm. Thanksgiving was a hoot like an absolute like this is the sort of movies this guy should be making and just make him make these movies and not do another Death Wish remake um, you know like like I feel there's a part where we, we, we're getting like people voices that maybe had their swing missed <laughs> like missed badly who were heralded as like the Ty West is another great example of that of a director who people were like oh well he's written off I mean that's that's him done who have taken a bit of time away come back studio system's a little bit different than what it was before and they come back with what the M. Night Shyamalan's another great example has come back with what they know or actually what got them to the place that they're at and actually it turns out the audiences are a bit more um acclimated to get on board with that now so it's not it's not as hard to sell to sell a movie like thanksgiving this year than it would be back in 2018 he's not getting that movie made in 2018 but this right, year, right right there's enough there's enough kind of paid for him so much so we're getting a sequel because that part of the industry will never change <laughs> you know what i mean oh this movie did really really well sequel um but yeah i, I think i think it's exciting I think it's harder to watch everything, but at the same time, I also think, moreover, and not even not moreover is not even the right term. I think, essentially now, even if you don't know what you like in horror, or you want to get into horror, and you don't want to have to scour, you know, like pages and pages of IMDb to find loads of old stuff to educate yourself. I think there's almost a movie in every subgenre that has come out this year that has been of a respectable quality that you could get into and then build your knowledge from there. I don't know if I could say that 10 years ago. I think 10 years ago we would have been saying, right, there's a couple of slasher movies, there's a couple of zombie movies, there's these art house movies and nothing else in between. Um, and nowadays I feel there really is something that you could kind of pick off anywhere and follow through some of it i love some of Mm -hmm. it i could not be any less interested with but the the way it's delivered now for audiences is so much better what so when thinking about the second part of that question which was you know what do we think the next big thing is i think the next big thing is here i don't think it's one thing i think it's it's almost everything And that's the exciting bit. I think there are filmmakers doing like really interesting work this year in genres which have maybe been a bit stale for a while or maybe needed that injection of energy like you said about the... I think you're right as well. Like the new Evil Dead movie, Evil Dead Rise, in a world where that Evil Dead remake hadn't come out, I would have been so high on that movie and been like, this is how you do this movie with gore and violence and all the rest. But that remake came out, and that remake was, like, punched well above what it should have done. That, as a mm-hmm. result, Evil Dead Rise is like, oh, yeah, that's a cool kind of in-the-same-universal sort of movie. That's fine. Didn't, didn't like, blow my mind or anything. But at the same yeah. time, I was like, this is a very... is a super violent, super gory movie, and I'm seeing it on the big screen in a packed fucking cinema of people that I know for a fact have never seen an Evil Dead movie. Um... And that's it, it, it has been a year, and I will I will not that mild spoilers for this <laughs> for Last Voyage of the Demeter. Yeah. Um, but this has been a year of child violence in a way <laughs> that I have delighted in. <laughs> like Evil Dead Rise, uh, you know, there are a couple of moments where because it's dealing with kids. I mean, they're teenagers. Yeah. 
but they're kind of young teenagers and they get fucked up oh yeah and <laughs> in a way that, that i was kind of surprised by yeah that it was it like this is truly violent and i i dug it and the, the, you know I, last voyage of the demeanor has something similar with an even younger kid mm. that's like this is fucked up <laughs> um and but it, it incredible and so i i think i think you're right i think that it is being able to go to a theater and kind of pick what sort of horror movie you're into at any given time yeah and there's probably gonna be people in there like I I haven't been I haven't seen Thanksgiving yet and that's that's my fault. I think it's just the Eli Roth thing, right? Like I'm I think, just yeah, I think I've been burned, Duncan. Yeah, I think I think it's taken a lot of him doing other shit to realize that he has a voice in a lane which speaks to kind of douchebaggery, and as long as he's doing that, I'm fine. As long as he creates these characters that I'm like, this is an obnoxious character that needs to die horribly, and then he gives me the death of that character, I am fine with that. He can keep doing that for me, because the payoff in that movie is surprisingly bonkers and very, very, very fun. Like, very, 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 very fun. He's taken a short trailer that he did for Grindhouse, and he's actually managed to make it in a movie in a way which other short kind of trailer pitch reels to long form movies do not work he managed to do that so i will give him his credit i think it is worth checking out but at the same time one of my favorite things i've seen this year i can't imagine it's not one of yours because i know we we had a little uh, back and forth online uh, when evil looks yeah fuck yeah is just is a home run of a movie that is it's existential it deals with religion it has a really kind of weird world in which it's set where like the idea of demons buffing at people is just something the government's aware of kind of has to deal with um but at the same time is a nasty gory little movie you know what i mean that's one that goes all in with the gore uh where it needs to very 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 unpleasant and that's a movie that is topping a ton of lists this year. And that's not just critics of the audiences that I was tracking online that are behind that movie. God, this is fucking rad. I think speaks to just where we are with education. One of my favourite movies this year, speaking about the old uh, art house aesthetic, is a movie that probably won't play well at people that aren't my age and aren't living in the UK. But in its main... I absolutely fucking adored this year, and it is. It speaks to. It's a. It reminds me of old TV in my country, and I've spoken mm -hmm. about this at times. Like you, you would switch on, it would be like midnight, and I couldn't sleep, and I had a TV in my room, and I'd be like six, and I would switch on like one like channel three in the UK, and then something like Tales from the Unexpected would come on, which is basically Roald Dahl's creepy short stories made into standalone anthology episodes with this trippy, horrific organ fairground intro, which was like like a Bond intro credit sequence, but done on acid. And um you would just be like it would finish and your brain just could not digest everything you've just seen in half an hour on TV and Ennis Main just reminds me that everything's like off balance, nothing's right this is creepy and I can't tell you why it's creepy, it's just a woman checking on a flower, this is like an ever like burn it, burn it down um, I, like, and that's, that's one of those examples of where I was like this is, once again this is a, a strange small art house horror movie and I, I absolutely adore it for reasons that I find very difficult to articulate. I that is one I haven't seen yet. It is on my short list. Yeah. Um, if but... any American likes it, I will be very surprised. It's so regional. It's it's like the way I there are certain American regional horror movies that I watch uh, from the like from the old days, and I sit and I get mm. through them, and I get to the end, and I'm like, I don't those guys were fucked up over there. I'm glad that they started their own country. Um, I'm glad they got the far fuck away from us. Um, but then this is the same thing. I just don't think this... But then you guys... like, There's there's a kind of renaissance in like American viewing and things for like stuff like the Stone Tapes and Queer Mass mm -hmm. and stuff. So it might play better there because that's the world in which it's born from. So... 
I all right. This is just the period where I ask you if you've seen some weird movies. <laughs> Go for it. So, have you seen? Because, but like, when evil lurks, both of us, I think, really, I you prefer terrified. I think I like when evil lurks more. I think if I watch when evil lurks more, I think it'll move up a little bit for me. I think there's, I think there's, I think there's more depth in when evil lurks. I think Terrifier caught me so unawares. Like, I was going into this going, right, this dude directed one of my favourite horror movies two years ago. So I was expecting greatness from mm -hmm. this one. And it delivered that greatness, but I had a had a baseline of what I thought I was going to get. Um, when I saw Terrified, um, the first time I had, like, a, a country that's yeah. not known for their horror movies, a director I've never heard of before, and I sat and I was like... I think I was maybe about five minutes into a movie and I'd, it had already like given me a jump scare and I was just like, I don't like this. <laughs> like, this is just weird and wrong and different. So I think if I come back to it, I think with a second viewing, I'll be on the same page as you. I think it's, it's one of my favourite things I've seen this year. I think it's yeah, the, by, by a margin one of my favourite things I've seen this year. The, the moment of the mother holding the kid walking down the road... Yeah. And I will say no more about it <laughs> yeah. if you haven't seen it. Is one of the biggest like what in the fuck yeah. kind of like like the 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 great thing. Do you remember all, all off the top of your head who directed those? I cannot think of his name. Uh, but the, Damien the guy, Rugner. Yeah. So the guy who did uh, those two films, he's got a gives no fucks kind of style of filmmaking yeah. where it's just like. I'm going to think of the craziest, most disturbing shit, and I'm just going to put it on the screen. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, like, Terrified did a great job of that. Like, that whole sequence with the little boy at the table is one of the most yeah. terrifying things <laughs> that yeah. has ever happened Lives in movies. rent-free in my head to this day. I can close my eyes, and I could almost Hannibal Lecter draw it. Mm -hmm. see, see, he can draw the scene scene from the yeah. Velvet Air. You know what I mean? I, I literally, yeah, yeah. literally can do that with that scene. It's, it's, it's painfully scarred itself into my brain. And and likewise, the scene with that mother walking down the road yeah. with the kid, it has kind of occupied a similar space in my mind of like, when I just think of stuff that is just wrong, you know, <laughs> like there is a wrongness to that being a thing that was conceived written and put on film and and but that's what makes it kind of genius but yeah. all right so have you seen uh husera the bone woman yes i did yeah, yeah, yeah which which i also thought was terrific in a yep. lot of ways um it a really strange it like it reminded me weirdly of the babadook i think it would make a, a good double feature with that yeah, yeah, yeah. of like here is a take on motherhood that you don't normally see but there is a sequence in that movie mm -hmm. where the mother in question is listening to a baby monitor mm -hmm. here's the baby crying you hear you know, like the the camera stays static in her bedroom and you see her leave you hear her go into the room you hear her pick up the baby and then leave again mm -hmm. and then she just comes back into the room and and lies down with no more a baby crying. Yeah. And you're just like, I don't know what in the fuck just happened, <laughs> but it's not good. <laughs> and <laughs> that is one of the, like one of those moments that I thought was, uh, what was really tremendous, mm. uh, for, for, a, you know, a horror film that has a really interesting perspective on motherhood and, and that kind of thing. Um, and it's weird to me also that I have not seen Suitable Flesh yet. Yeah. Which is a movie written by the guy who did From Beyond and Reanimator, produced yeah. by Brian Yuzna and Barbara Crampton. Yeah. Who is also it like it is a return to Stuart Gordon form. Mm -hmm. And I haven't watched it yet. Yeah. I thought it was That's like, crazy. I think it's I think it is a fine movie. I'm maybe not like it got a lot of track, like a lot of traction. It's Joe Lynch that directed it, so and it's kind of his return back to horror. He's mm -hmm. been away from that for a while, um, and I like the performances and I liked it overall. It's a very sexual film, <laughs> like so, like the, like he's like full on just like oozing with sex all the way through it. Um, I didn't love it. Okay, so, have you seen? All right, 
you know, no, another, <laughs> hey, have you seen this? Have you seen Wrath of Becky? Uh, no, so I've seen the original Becky. I've not seen Wrath of Becky. Okay. Let me, let me pitch it to you this way, because I love it. It's one of my favorite things I've seen this year. Um, what if you took the movie Becky and said, hey, what if Becky just became a complete badass mm -hmm. and then runs afoul of some skinheads? No, I have seen I have seen Wrath of Becky. Yeah. I have, right. Yes. Because, yes, I have seen Wrath of Becky. I, I have seen that, it. I, way back at the start of the year. Like way, yeah. way, way back. I it's it, it's a great Sean William Scott performance, which I enjoy. That's right, Sean William Scott. I I have seen it. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's very short. Like it's an hour twenty or something. That movie should not be longer than an hour twenty. <laughs> like, yeah, and it, I mean the biggest problem I have with it is it sort of ends in a place where I'm like, all right, you're clearly setting up a sequel, which I'm down for, but. You probably like, not going to get it. an hour 20. You could give me 15 minutes of this other movie you're pitching and I'm good with it. Yeah. Uh, but I thought that was super fun of like, let's take this premise and just blow it up mm. in a really campy way. Um, okay. Here, I, I, rapid fire. Give it so <laughs> uh, what about Malum? Have you seen this? Yes, I did see Malum. But All then right. I see, I, I've seen the, the, the movie, which is not that old, that it's a remake of. So, so here's the thing that, that, I, it, my, here's my position on Malum. Yeah, uh, I liked it the first time I saw it <laughs> when it cost less money and 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 was somehow scary. I, I like Last think, Shift, yeah. I think is way scarier than Malum oh, 100%. is. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. And I I was really bummed watching it, man. Like I was I was like I like this premise. I like this director. Why did you go back and make like? I would much rather see you do something original than just remake something that yeah. was already good. Yeah, like there's a, there's a, I I think sometimes like people don't understand there's a there's a reason why Sam Raimi made Evil Dead Two mm -hmm. because he was literally like right now I understand filmmaking I'm gonna go and do this again right the last shift is a movie like it's a, it's a very well made very competent like yeah. delivers the heart like it wasn't as if he had to go away and learn a new trick and then come back that's the thing that confuses me i'm like why are you telling the same story again but like like it's, it, honestly it, it's kind of like it's it's the lucas effect that is george lucas going back and fixing star wars and then you watch it you're like that no all the stuff that made star wars great You've just undone with every change. Like you've just taken away the the, the bits that made him a, a kind of interesting roguish character, or stuff that I don't need in detail about this. Um, it kind of reminded me of that it felt like at no point someone sat him down and said, "You know, we are funded here to make a completely new project. Maybe we should just do that." Yeah. It. Yeah. It's. It's frustrating to me. You know given our earlier conversation about like there are all these lanes now yeah yeah like why not just do something like if you want to remake it like set it in the same universe and everything that's fine yep but do something different with it don't just don't give me the same thing with slightly better production value yeah but the you know it's the lesson that he did not learn is that necessity being the mother in, of invention requires you to sometimes make some decisions that you may not be happy with yeah. but ultimately make your movie scarier it's a, you know the barrels and jaws yes you know like that makes your movie better and you the, what w yeah i i'm very frustrated by malum i like it's a real burr in my saddle yeah <laughs> every time i think about it i'm just like why did you waste time doing this you wasted your time making the movie you wasted my time watching the movie I'm very upset about all of this. <laughs> what? You know. Oh, look, I saw The Meg 2, directed I, by your I friend always, of mine, Ben Wheatley. Yeah, which I, I mean. The movie that begs the question, isn't there supposed to be a shark in this movie? Yeah, um, I, I, I honestly don't know what happened there um, at all because that the last 20 minutes of that movie are what that whole movie should be and I don't know how you can... I don't know how you can take a giant shark movie and just make it so ponderous for the majority of it. Like, like I mean, we're not remaking Jaws here. What would, it, what would yeah. it like? We've made the fun version of this movie. Your job is to make it more fun not inject a story 
Like, I don't want a story. <laughs> like, I can care less about a story. Well, what happened there is that Bid Weedley got paid. Well, yeah. uh, he, he, like, yeah. his, his new project is a TV show. I think it's a six-part zombie TV show, which sounds bitching. And I wonder if it was a case of, I just need to get through this project. Because people forget, this is a movie he essentially got given because his other movie fell through. He was supposed mm-hmm. to be doing the Tomb Raider movie. No shit. Yes, his name was... So he come off... Um, he did uh, In the Earth mm-hmm. and then it was lined up specifically for that. I think the Tomb Raider movie was supposed to happen before that, then COVID happened. Um, and he was lined up and it was going to be his gnarly gritty retelling in the jungle with mysticism and all this. And it sounded fucking bitching, right? Uh, mm-hmm. The tomb, uh, the studio that owns Tomb Raider is the same studio that owns the Meg 2. Uh, so he got switched from that project to the Meg 2. <laughs> and I get the feeling ah. he was just like that. We're just going to get through this. <laughs> like, we're just going to do this movie and I'm going to go back to doing the stuff that I want to do. Um, which is his TV show that is about to come out. So It was, it was very dumb, which yeah. I wanted it to be. But you're right. It, there, there's a little too much story in it. Yeah. And it's like, just, I, I want to see a big shark eating stuff. It was better than The Meg. I'll give it that much. Yeah, I, The Meg is a dumb fucking movie. That's the, that's the, the Meg is, like, it is a, is the, I don't need to watch any of this movie. I can get up at any point and come back and I know exactly where I am in the movie. <laughs> like, I could go away for half an hour. I could go away and help my brother put up some shelves in his house and then come back and sit down and I know exactly where I am in the movie. Well, yeah, you're right. the The problem with it, though, is that it it pulls too many punches, oh, and at least with Meg Two, Ben Wheatley knew enough to be like, "Oh no, no, no! It, yes, it is going to be as dumb as you want it to be." Yeah, but also there's going to be, uh, you know, enough shark action that it makes some kind of. Well, I was going to say sense, but no. <laughs> and, I know, I you know, know. like, <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch of dinosaurs and shit jumping around in that movie. And it's like, this is all <laughs> utter nonsense. But uh, but I appreciate it for being utter nonsense. Like, it, it's it's a really stupid movie that I appreciate for being as stupid as it is. Mm. It's it's over long. Mm, yeah. Uh, for sure. But I, you know. Ben Wheatley's amazing, and I, I'm I knew nothing about this TV show, and now I'm excited for that because oh yeah, like this is you know. this is his like, he started in TV and he made some really bizarre surreal TV, so I am I am very curious to see because I believe he's got full creative control over it, so that's what I want to see. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. So give me that, please. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's <laughs> I would love to like I need an in the earth TV series. Yeah. He's, I, like, yeah. it's, he's, I think Ben Wheatley's the sort of, like we spoke about when we were talking about the Palma on the De Palma episode. I just think Ben Wheatley can just pull those sorts of movies out whenever he wants. Well, you mean, that's a, that was mm-hmm. a, I can't shoot any movies. We're locked in in COVID. I could probably do stuff with a limited crew out in the woods. Oh, let me just knock out a story and go away and do that. You know what I mean? That's, that's a, that's a him, like, like, uh, like just I need to do something to fill time movie and it's fucking incredible so I get the feeling that he just do those movies whenever he he just pull a kill list out whenever he wants I just think that sometimes people want him to do other movies which is alright yeah sure uh, like not everything can be a field in England no oh god no um, <laughs> but yeah I mean you know going back to our, our original discussion about you know where is art house now um, you know, part of it is just like things have moved to television too. You yeah. know, like The Last of Us is good kind of art house horror. Yeah. You know, that it under the guise of prestige television. Um, I also think movies are incorporate. Well, it was the same that we mentioned earlier on. I think this was once again off air when we were talking about Twin Peaks. Twin Peaks raised the bar for TV writers because they realised they could be more narratively challenging to audiences and all audiences would go along with that so you can get we mentioned that I cited Sopranos as an example the dream sequences in Sopranos are super fucked up and really bizarre mm-hmm. and they, they're like very 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 out there but they incorporate so well into the show I think the ideas and concepts that are delivered through art house movies are folded into a lot more mainstream horror movies as a kind of 
at to the side sort of thing. So you get those scenes that are, you mentioned Cobweb. Cobweb, in a lot of respects, plays itself as dealing with stuff in a much more cerebral fashion than it turns out to be and all the better for it because it kept me guessing mm-hmm. when I watched it um, you mentioned before uh, James Wan with the Malignant like I watched that movie and that is the folding of higher concept jello ideas into what is essentially a hen and lot or basket case rip off <laughs> uh, like it sort of folds it in so it finds like a cross in between I think you can have both you have like the ones that don't like like the the movies that don't try and do anything even remotely heady because they're not interested in it and those that are purely in that lane but there's also that space to incorporate the best of both and bring them in together and you can still mm-hmm. have directors like i don't think we will ever see um someone like an ari aster make a straight down the middle film i don't think it's mm-hmm. in him and i don't want it like bo's afraid for me um, was a trip maybe one of my favourite cinema experiences this year because all the way through the movie I was just sitting there going what's next like how is it like I felt like I was hyperventilating watching the movie I was just constantly on the edge all the way through it and I don't think I know many filmmakers at all that can make me hysterically laugh at the absurdity on screen but feel so claustrophobically nauseous and and anxious like side by side in, in, in scenes and he just operates on that level Robert Eggers tried God bless him he tr- he, tr- he tried he was like that I'm gonna do my bigger movie I'm gonna do The Northman it's a fucking great movie it mm-hmm. just didn't do well for people right so he's now went back to what he knows but that what he knows is the movie he's been painstakingly trying to make for over a decade and he got he, he got he, by the sims of things he has pretty much got everything he wanted uh, to make this movie except some of the cast which he's replaced and he's now super confident with the, the, the you know the cast that he's got in that one so he's dedicated to that we need people that dedicate their their voices to those endeavors we also need the filmmakers that sit in between that you know when they get the opportunity to show a bit of something else or bring in an outside influence or you know pay homage to some other subgenre that's doing something and fold it in the mainstream we need that because that's how you educate your audiences to make the trip a little bit further out i didn't just wake up one day and decide i like art house horror mm-hmm. i watched a series of movies that got me interested in other directors or directors mentioning other directors that made me check out those movies and then check out more movies and then before i knew it, i'd found a vein that i just wanted to constantly tap that's kind of how that works and it, 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 it requires the mainstream at times to be a bit more challenging and in a year where you can go and see an evil dead rise you can also go and see a movie like megan which i had a fucking ball with it is sure. you know what i mean it is it's chucky right it's child's play it's child's play with computers and robots um mm-hmm. but i watched that movie and like all the way through it i was like yeah they've they've went for the here are the beats to make this movie and we're going to hit every single beat exactly when it's supposed to land and if you've seen loads of these horror movies before it's going to feel familiar but it's not going to feel like too stagey and if you've never seen this before as an audience we know exactly when your attention is likely to drop and that's when shit's going to happen all the way through that movie moves so fast that by the end yeah. of it, almost like the guys that made Five, Night, Five Nights at Freddy's should have watched that movie and seen how to make a movie that has, I don't know, things that happen all the way through it. <laughs> uh, to Characters keep... that you might like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like stuff like that. Um, yeah. So, oh, I, that was a disaster. That, that is such a slog. And I don't care how much Jason Blum wants to sit there and talk about the Five Nights at Freddy's massive coming out and support this movie when it was released and all the rest. That was a fucking slog to get through. Like, I was exhausted watching it because nothing happened. And even when it did happen, it revealed it. Like, even... See, as soon as Stu from Scream shows up, right? Matthew Lillard, right? I love him. He's in Twin Peaks. There's our Twin Peaks reference. Mm -hmm. Um, When he showed up and he was acting weird at the beginning, I turned around to my wife and I was like that. I bet you he's the villain. And that is literally mm-hmm. what I said. And I sat back and then painfully 
slowly waited for the most obvious reveal in cinema history. Yeah, well, I mean, it's like if you're watching uh, Law and Order <laughs> and the guest star is like, you know, Oscar Isaacs. And, and he's in it for three minutes at the beginning, and you're yeah. like, well, he's coming back. You're not paying Oscar Isaacs to show up for two minutes. It's like, watch, you know? it's like watching an episode of Columbo where they reveal the killer at the end and being surprised that the killer's revealed at the end. Like, yes. like, like when you watch Columbo, yes. they always show you the murder at the start. Yeah. If you get to the end of an episode of Columbo, and Columbo's like, you see, sir, I think you're the killer, and you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. What Ever the fuck am I doing? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely like I had a blast with Megan. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, much like I thought that Child's Play remake was surprisingly I'm, good. I'm as well. fine with that as well. It's different in a way that I kind of enjoy. Like like Megan to me gave me the same amount of joy mm -hmm. as the Orphan Two gave me. The you know, the Orphan Two, the orphaning <sighs> gave me the year before when it was campy, it was over the top, it yeah. was everything I wanted, and I come at this and I'm a smiling. Literally yeah, all right. I want. right. And, yes, the you know, I was not surprised when Five Nights at Freddy's made, you know, a billion dollars because, <laughs> you know, because I teach high school and before that movie came out, every fucking kid was like, you're going to, we're going to go see, you know, FNAF this weekend, right? Yeah, yeah. we're going to go see FNAF. And, you know, the, <laughs> I came in the weekend after that premiere because they, you know, it simultaneously dropped on Peacock the streaming service yeah. as well as the theaters and that's where i saw it and so i come into class uh the the next monday and they're all talking about it. i was like i don't know what you guys are talking about that movie was shit i'm an i'm an old man who has seen a lot of movies and i know how they're supposed to work and it's not like that <laughs> 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 But Bo, Bo's newspaper high school goes round. Old man yells at Cloud, and it's just that's like yeah, Five Nights at Freddy's. A hundred percent. And the kids were like, "Well, it didn't follow the games." I was like, "I don't give a fuck." Yeah. <laughs> what games it did or did not follow? When I'm watching a movie, I expect a certain amount of narrative. Yeah. <laughs> For thirty minutes of that movie, I did not know that that little girl was not his daughter. Mm. And then when he's like, oh, yeah, my sister, I'm like, it's your sister? When did that happen? <laughs> also, also, Duncan. All right, let me don't trip on my soapbox here. Uh, also, Duncan, what in the like, who is the fucking villain of this movie? Yeah. Is it the kids who got murdered? Mm -hmm. Because that's what it seems like until the end when they're the good guys. And why are we building fucking forts with them in the middle of the movie? Yeah. Out of the tables. And we're listening, what, like, Walking on Sunshine or whatever the fuck song is playing. <laughs> and I'm like, how is, why are we supposed to, isn't this a goddamn horror movie? What the fuck? <laughs> I, oh, I hated that movie so much. It made me mad every step of the way. It'd be, it'd be, like, watching, it'd be like watching Kujo and then realizing in the middle of the movie all the dog wanted was that bag of snacks in the glove compartment. <laughs> Well, if if D Wallace had gotten out of the car at the midway point of that movie and played Who's fetch with boy? Cujo, Who's a, who's a, who's a, who's a belly right? Boy? Who's a boy? Who's a biscuit? Who's a good biscuit? And then the the dog was like, "Oh, wait a second, uh, arr, 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 arr. oh, back in the car, you know, like <laughs> that's not that's not how movies work, Duncan." <laughs> <laughs> totally oh, I got rabies, Raggy. <laughs> <laughs> I totally want that cut of that movie. I want that cut. I want that. I want the director's cut of Kujo. Uh, yeah, but I want the, the, <laughs> the FNAF cut of Kujo. <laughs> the FNAF cut. Release the FNAF cut. Uh, yeah, you cowards. <laughs> Lewis Teague, you coward. I think that's who directed that. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah, the, like that movie really sucked. And I, I, and everybody, not everybody, there were a lot of articles floating around about like, oh, this is you know good gateway horror. It's like no, it's not good gateway. Like the Monster Squad, a movie that I don't particularly care for, way better. Scary gateway stories horror. to tell in the dark is a great right. gateway horror movie because it has yeah. it has the creepiness, it has all the teen stuff in it. It's not too scary. 
dude, I'll take the fucking Goosebumps movie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which at least had, like, I mean, it's not overly scary or anything, but it uses those tropes. It at least has characters in a story that is consistent. <laughs> like, at no point do all of the villains get together to have a party with the heroes. And that, oh, man. I just, I, it blew my mind. And that was the, the director was the woman who directed The Wind. Yeah. Which is a really interesting. A fucking great movie. Yeah. And it's, I don't know that, I, I mean, look, the movie made a billion dollars. There's got to be <laughs> two or three more of these fucking things. <laughs> and I'm stupid enough that I'll watch it. And oh, then I'm going to be on my deathbed, Duncan. I'm going to be like, I wasted hours. <laughs> watching those five nights at freddy's movies and never should have the same way the same way duncan i feel every time i realize that i've seen all the subspecies movies <laughs> multiple times in some cases which by the way that last subspecies movies not terrible it was okay let's get that on the poster for that movie four runs though not terrible it was okay <laughs> Yeah, a movie that I expected to be utter crap turned out to be all right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, right, like that movie, the, the what, seventh subspecies movie? Uh -huh. Better than Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> at least had an emotional core that I could respond to in some way. Made, made the character somewhat sympathetic. Redu, the drooling shit vampire that you've come to know and love strangely emotional you get you you understand duncan why he is the way he is um <laughs> is, which is one of those rare cases where it's like let's do a prequel starring the same actor who is now four times as old as he was yeah. when we started this series and you're like i get it but also don't this is some straight up fucking phantasm shit right here like you can keep yeah. dying that guy's here but his face is old now <laughs> like, right. oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, nobody is asking Anders Hove to run anywhere because yeah. if you do, he is like his legs are gonna snap like a couple of Twix bars. <laughs> Bo Ransdell, I promised the listeners that we would do this episode in an hour, and believe it or not, we are oh. now at the hour mark. Oh no! But uh, what I want to do is, I want to give you the opportunity to pimp your shows. Uh, before we bring this and I do feel that we may need to reconnect early next year and just do uh, a 2023 the year that was um, yeah 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 for so sure. we should probably do that here because I get to feel more scratching the surface of a lot of grievances and a lot of great movies I want to stress that there's a lot of things that piss me off this year a whole lot of movies that I kind of thought were fucking great so yeah um, it, it was a real strong year for horror for sure yeah um, there was just so much of it like there's just, mm -hmm. there's just so much there's just so much of it at the cinema as well there's not one mm -hmm. month that has went past this year that there hasn't been at least two or three cinematic horror movies with a budget and you know a push from a studio behind it which like whether i go and see them all or not is 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 better than the position we were in like I say, over a decade ago where it was one and it came out in October and then you were waiting a while until the next one and then the studio might release it or it might go straight to DVD. You never knew. So mm -hmm. that's... that's like, hey, there. yeah, like you said, here's, here's some good horror in the theatre and by the way, oh, here's when evil lurks to blow your fucking mind. Yeah, and here's all the streaming sites now that we're just putting content out as well. So see, if you don't want to go and watch those movies, stay at home and watch these movies. And mm -hmm. yeah, spoiled for choice. Spoiled, I see. Oh yeah, that more movies than you can shake a really big stick at, Duncan. <laughs> and I've tried. I've seen you. The number, I, sometimes I stand in my basement looking at my movie screen with my stick and I just shake it at the screen and the screen is blank face Duncan it tells me nothing it is it's staring into the empty face of eternity <laughs> that's no but stick. that's um... that's that's usually after I've had a couple of edibles though where I'm like <laughs> take this screen Urgh, shake 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 Bo, you do, you do, you do, like panically, you do shows. Where can people check out your stuff, buddy? Yeah, yeah. So, um, for a while there, we were still keeping up with Pick Six movies. That has come to an end. Mm. Um, be, because uh, neither Chad or I uh, could spend like 14 hours a week working on it, uh, which is what that show took. Mm. Um, 
but there are like 150 episodes. I was about to say the catalog, the rich catalog of what you guys went through is worth anyone either starting or revisiting. Post-taste. Yeah, if, if you've never listened to Pick Six movies, I highly recommend it. It, it, it was uh, a good show, and we're we're kind of pitching the idea of like let's do a quarterly episode yeah. here and there, just just you know because movies keep coming out, Duncan, and some <laughs> of them deserve to be mocked. <laughs> One of the last movies we did, as a matter of fact, was Five Nights at Freddy's. That was our like. <laughs> that's the one that. That's the one that. You it, want, no, it was. It was. It, it was our series finale. Like we can't get and, this again. Uh, and that's why I hate. Maybe that's why I hate it so much. Because uh, I'm. I feel like it's taken something it away from here. me. Broke you. Finally broke you. It was. Oh man, I hate that movie so much. Anyway, uh, but then you can listen to the Dark Parade, which is uh, a show that. Uh, it hasn't necessarily been on hiatus, but mm. it's been real spotty in terms of releases. However, there is uh, an episode, um, as you're listening to this, it's probably out already, of uh, Kate Pollock and myself doing another Heart of Horror, Thanks. where we talk about the movie Voices, as well as, uh, you know, weird sex stuff, which is what always happens. <laughs> and um, and here's the thing I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of doing. I haven't started doing it yet, but I've got all my notes lined up. And so, Duncan, I want I want to get your take on it. Oh, right. Go for it. Um, I have been... I love sleazy movies. <laughs> sleazy bull is what they call you. Yeah, old, old, take it sleazy. That's what I tell everybody when I, I leave... I take I, I take my my farewells. <laughs> like take it sleazy, everybody. Like but I'm always retirement saying. cards and stuff. Like everyone's be- kind regards, best wishes, all the rest. Take it sleazy. <laughs> take it sleazy, says Bo Ransdell. Um, yeah. So I've been, <laughs> I've 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 been watching those witchcraft movies. Oh no. And and <laughs> I think I'm gonna do a a, a quick series. That is just a brief overview of the witchcraft series as a whole. I find them hilarious. Um, Take so this, Stephen it, Hawkins, a brief history of time. I laugh at thee. Have a brief history of witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> what started this, Duncan? I know I'm supposed to be just pimping a show and then shutting <laughs> up. We're not talking about movies now, so we're fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there was a movie called... I th- uh, Like... Blood Sisters of Lesbian Sin, I think is the name of it. <laughs> and that, I watched that on Tubi because, of course, it was on Tubi. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is the place where movies like that go. And it was from, like, the 80s. And I watched it, and, the, like, the movie's 74 minutes long. It's stupid as shit. But also, it was like, this was super entertaining. Mm. And there is something to be said for that kind of movie. And so that's what I'm getting at with, with uh, the, all this under the banner of the Dark Parade. That's what you ought to subscribe to if you, if you haven't already. Um, but it's it's just being able to talk about like really bad movies, but also movies that that for whatever reason will occupy space in your brain. Mm-hmm. And ever since I saw Blood Sisters of Lesbian Sin... Which is truly one of the great <laughs> cinematic titles. Um, I have been thinking about doing a show that is just dedicated to like that kind of schlock that just got shoveled out the door in mm. the eighties and early nineties. Um, that I really enjoy, like movies like Breeders and stuff like that, where it's just like this is terrible. No one's <laughs> arguing the quality of this movie. Like this is not showing up. Uh, you know. The, the director of Breeders not going to be on the in memoriam at the Oscars when he <laughs> passes away. And yet, you mention that movie to people who have seen they're like, oh yeah, that movie's fucking weird. Yeah. And it's like, right, right. You remember it because it sticks in your head because it's sleazy and weird. And nobody makes movies like that because you shouldn't. And... <laughs> And that is that is the approach I'm taking. I am talking about movies that should never have been made. Maybe that's what I ought to call. <laughs> Not how did this get made? Why did this get? Why made? did this get made? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I will check that out. And we, we've been we, we were joking a little bit earlier on off air, not committing to anything hard. But um, DBCC, we know we hear you. You're out there. 
you're, mm -hmm. you're call you're crying out of the darkness and we we yeah. hear your cries we will formulate something in an orderly fashion that fits yes. our living arrangements and we we're, will come back in one way shape or form we're listening <laughs> We've heard your complaints. No, and and the it, like the problem is totally me. I've got to take one more test and finish one more online course, mm. and then I am done with like the additional schooling I have to do on top yeah. of being a, a first teacher. year teacher. Yeah. <laughs> and and what they say, Duncan, it's true. Uh, the great thing about teaching is you have a lot of free time, and the pay is great. <laughs> and all of that is totally accurate. Uh, but I I tend to uh, spend a lot of time um developing tests to torture the students hmm. i i like to think of myself as the jigsaw of our <laughs> high school where as soon as they come in I'm like i want to play a game <laughs> well, I, I mean it's uh, I, I it's not where i thought you were going i thought you were going with the old uh, dennis hopper from speed <laughs> it would be like a pop quiz hot shot and you're like oh whoa, is that pop quiz like no don't do this to us that's right. If you, if your score on this test is below fifty five, the whole school blows. <laughs> yeah, I we, you can't even joke about that in the United States, Duncan, because every every kid is armed. They've got holsters and bandoliers. It's like a, it's like teaching a classroom full of Chewbacca's. <laughs> like for this assignment, you're getting a B. I mean A A. Did I say B? I meant A. You got an A. All right, stand down. Yeah. <laughs> stand 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 by and stand ready uh, uh but uh, if, like there's a lot of hey did everybody have uh trouble with the homework and the response is always i'm your huckleberry and i'm like mm, that's not good <laughs> john ringo you madcap oh uh, yeah so we have heard you um, something yes. will something will happen next year. We're committing to yes. absolutely nothing, though, because that is the smart approach. <laughs> and, and honestly, the spirit of DBCC is yeah, like it is like we are the uh, uh, temple of the dog of the podcasting <laughs> world of the s offshoot super group yeah. that comes out with a hunger strike and say hello to heaven yeah and then disappears for some yeah years. it was like then... te like teases you with greatness and you hear that greatness and you're like this greatness needs to continue more regular and then we're like what <laughs> yeah and and i know you listeners are going hungry <laughs> i like the ethos of dbcc is commit to nothing so that way you can always over deliver <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Pr promise nothing. Uh, it, yeah, it's it's the Cameron from Ferris Bueller. Uh, <laughs> if you go through life depressed, everything's a, a, a pleasant surprise. Um, <laughs> so we will be doing that. We will be doing that. Bo, it's always a pleasure chatting to you. If you've not checked out that De Palma episode that we did, dropped a couple of weeks ago, absolute stone cold, excellent episode. However, that is primarily down to Doug, and we saw yeah, you. Yeah, it, it's Kelly. a banger, despite the involvement of Duncan and yeah. myself. <laughs> it's an average Doug performance, yet it's still better than anything we could hope to do. <laughs> I, like the the real cut that you need to do of that podcast is where you mute both of us out, and it's just like a, a cut of Doug, just one long episode of Doug talking about these movies and the only time you come in is like Doug tell me about you know Dionysus in 70 I do like the fact that you went Doug uh, which is basically in Scotland what we call a dog so Doug there's a Doug and your dog started barking <laughs> it's, like, it's like yes that is my name in Scotland I understand I, I, the... yeah I think he's going blind oh no because yeah, because he is, he is literally barking at the wall. Either that or my my house is now haunted. <laughs> Johnson, come here. So, uh, for Johnson and myself, Duncan, yes. we have to get out of here and bust some ghosts. Because, <laughs> as you know, busting makes me feel good. <laughs> you never
<laughs> right, ladies and gents, I'm going to take my final break. When I come back, I'm closing out the show and I'm done <laughs> right now. You are a bad man. <laughs> you son of a bitch. You son of a bitch. And thanks for checking out this episode of The Podcast Under The Stairs. Thank you very much to my guest, Bo Ransdell, for joining me. A little bit of a discussion for you guys as selected on a topic from the Facebook group page. Like I said before, this is the final listener choice episode. We have our Christmas Eve episode with The Baz, where the listeners have chosen the movie, but that doesn't technically count as a listener choice in the grand scheme of things. So yeah, that episode will be coming on Christmas Eve with another uh, poll selection from you guys out there. I hope this conversation with Bo has sparked some interest. I uh, encourage you to go and check out Duncan and Bo Come Correct. Wherever you listen to your podcast, it's available there. We've not put out anything this year, but we have a rich back catalogue of... Oh, there must be about close to 200 episodes on that feed talking about various different things from TV through movies and it will be returning in 2024 for you. As for the podcast under the stairs, if you're checking this video out on YouTube, then please give us a like, give us a subscribe and comment on this. What's your view? Do you think the age of art house horror movies is finally coming to an end? And if so, what do you think is geared up, revved, to take its place. If you're like myself and Bob, we think actually, if anything, there's just more choice now and it's less that it's losing its appeal. It's just there's more for the consumer to check out. Then let us know what you think on that one as well. What are you most excited about in this decade, the 2020s of horror? If you're checking us out with Spotify, please answer the question. Anchor the same way, also subscribe on both those feeds if you're checking us out there and for the podcast listeners on the podcast feeds please subscribe over there you get access to all the shows and when they drop and also access to the about 1300 episodes of podcasts under the stairs that exists on those rss feeds lastly i just want to thank you for checking out all the content we have been dropping you there are episodes dropping every single day from the first right through to the 24th before we take a couple of weeks off for christmas so, wherever you are, whatever the time zone is and whatever you're up to in this big bad world of ours, please take care of yourselves out there. This is Duncan McLeish broadcasting live from under the stairs and I am signing off.